Well, good morning, Kensington. We are about to step into a time of worship. Um, so fee please feel free to stand with us as we begin to sing. the king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh is my song and let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh is my song cause you are the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song let the king
Good morning, Kensington. It's so good to see your faces this morning. Amen. Um, we're going to watch a quick video, so please feel free to be seated. Welcome to church. Whether you are joining us in person or on the stream, we are so glad you're here with us in the first week of our new series, How to Take a Hit. I'm Shauna, and I've taken one too many hits in 2020. Can anyone relate? But I'm here to tell you that the blows we experience don't have to take us down. Take it from Joseph in the Bible. Talk about a roller coaster of a life. He went from favorite son to slave to ruler to prisoner to hero. More on that to come in this five-week series. Now that Halloween is officially behind us, it's time to ask one of the most frequently asked hard-hitting questions in our culture. Does November 1st officially kick off the Christmas season? If you're watching in person, give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And to everyone streaming, fill in the comments with Christmas emojis if you're in favor of Christmas starting now. We know there are a lot of you Christmas early birds out there. You are about to dust off that Christmas tote that's been stored away, put on some Mariah Carey's Christmas classics, and get in the spirit. Now make no apologies. We fully support Christmas early birds here at Kensington, as long as you don't skip over Thanksgiving. For us at Kensington, Thanksgiving marks a yearly tradition of delivering Thanksgiving baskets to families in our school partners community. It's our 26th year moving out together to provide thousands of Thanksgiving meals. You can donate to fund baskets, which are $50 each, and you can sign up to deliver a basket on Saturday, November 21st. The delivery process will look a little different with COVID-19 protocols, but we still have the opportunity to talk to the families who are receiving this special gift. It's not always about the meal. It's about the conversations and the relationships that happen because of it. You can go to kensingtonchurch.org slash thanksgiving to be a part of this tradition. We are so glad you showed up to church today as we dive into the first week of our new series. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Awesome. Are you guys in like candy coma? Anybody? I see some kids down here. Did you guys have fun trick-or-treating? Yeah? Thumbs up? All right, thank you so much. My name is Jill Cascone. I'm the campus director here for our Clarkson campus. Thank you all for braving. It was a full moon last night. It was fall back. It was Halloween on a Saturday, so you guys all get gold stars for being in church in the seats on a Sunday. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Thanks, Steve. And if you are joining us online, for those of you I've already been chatting with, um, but go ahead and say hello to us online. We're so glad that you're joining us as well. Um, all right, so we have a, a special video. Oh, first of all, sorry, really quick, Thanksgiving baskets. For those of you that have been a part of Kensington and you know what we are about with Thanksgiving baskets, it happens every single year, and we typically partner up with Owen Elementary in Pontiac. That's our school partner. This year, because of COVID-19, it looks different. So we're teaming up with our Orion campus friends, so just right down the road, um, and we still need people to register and sign up um, to deliver baskets. So you can head to that uh, kensingtonchurch.org slash Thanksgiving to do so. And if you can't deliver a basket on the 21st, you can go ahead and donate as well um, and to be praying over that event. Um, all right, so check out the special video we have from Jeremiah. Hey everybody, Jeremiah here. I hope you're doing great. I am so excited about this new series we're in, How to Take a Hit. We are going to talk about today that when things go unplanned and unscheduled and throw us off and we take the proverbial hit in life, that God has something planned better for us. And I'm excited that Steve Andrews gets to lead us into this today. I really wanted to be there with you today, but out of an abundance of caution, Marie and I decided to put ourselves in a quarantine, and here's why. Uh, we were with uh, some friends that ended up having COVID, and so they tested positive. So we went and got tests. Our test came back negative, thank God. Uh, but still, out of an abundance of caution, we wanted to care for those in our community that could be vulnerable. And we wanted to follow the CDC guidelines and just step back for a moment to protect those that may have compromised immune systems or just may be flat out more vulnerable than us. And you say, why would you do that? Here's why. 
in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is talking and he says that when you care for those that are vulnerable, when you care for those that are hurt, when you care for those that are with no clothes, that are naked, that are, he's getting to the point of more vulnerable than you and I. When we do that, it's like loving Jesus. And we want to have that kind of community. We want to have the kind of community that cares deeply for those that could be just that, more vulnerable than us. And so that's why we're doing what we're doing. I wanted to let you know. But I think you're going to have an incredible day. And even though I kind of took a hit, so to speak, and it took me out of the race today, uh, God has something better planned for you that you're going to discover uh, in this series about Joseph and how to take a hit. Love you. Can't wait to see you soon. See you in about a week. Bye. All right. So that is why Jeremiah and Maria are not here today. Uh, but like he said, we're super thankful their test came back negative. So amen for that. And with that, we get Steve Andrews today. Woo! <laughs> so awesome. So he is going to um, kick us off with our five-week series, How to Take a Hit. And I'm super excited for this series. Our very own Craig McGlassian, he's at our Orion campus, um, really dreamed this, this series up. Um, and we've got a really fun video um, with him on this. So go ahead and take a look. So I'm here at Stars and Strikes Gym in Westland where my buddy Ken Wolfmack is going to teach me how to actually take a hit today. So come on in. I'm about to teach you how to take a hit. That's going to determine if you're a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> when you get in your stance, your elbows tight, hands up, right? You always want to protect your face. So that's all you have to do is keep everything tight, make sure you cover your face. That's how you're going to do it. So after you throw the punch, you're going to bring it right back to your face. Okay. And then just make sure you stay protected. You want to hold it tight. So when you get hit, you want to be here. Got it. Okay. Okay. So you ready to take a hit? I'm ready. Okay. So you're not fighting stance. Okay. You here? Ready? Ready. Okay. Hit me. Hey, wake up. Quick. You good? Mm-hmm. Because you didn't do nothing I just told you. So now you've taught me how to take a hit. How about outside of the ring in just life in general? Like, I know from some of our conversations, I mean, life, like with everybody else, life has had moments where it's swung hard on you. And how has some of what you have learned, even here in the ring, about how to take a hit translated into moments in life? I was bullied my whole life. Mm. Went to nine different schools. Um, so being that new kid, wow. I'm sure people know that you get picked on a lot. And that was just through, like, from elementary to high school, nine different schools. Nine different schools. Wow. And uh, it wasn't easy. You know, kids <laughs> picked on me, so I had to hold my own. <laughs> had about 18 individual fights, jumped twice by 10-plus guys. I was good at it, which how, <laughs> <laughs> which how I kind of transitioned over becoming an athlete, being a basketball <laughs> player, and saw fighting was a sport. <laughs> but... Being bullied, that was another way I took a hit, too. Hmm. So, uh, so, so obviously, like you said, you, and those are moments where you learn to pray and, you know, that God was always important in your life. But w you know, like I do, like, we can go to church and just kind of go through all the motions. But it's more than that for you. Somewhere along the way, it became something very real. Like, Jesus became something very real for you. W when did that happen, and how did that happen? And I was looking for a church and ended up finding a church in Detroit. And uh, since then, that when I first heard the pastor there speak, that truly hit me like, wow, I finally, truly found a good church. And, and you're pretty involved there, too. I am. Um, so now I'm a lead teacher for the elementary school. A lead teacher for the elementary school, which lead is teacher. awesome. Which is great. Because you would think, take a guy like you and put him on security. Right. Which I have done security, too. <laughs> <laughs> I have done security, too. Um, that's a funny story, too, with doing the kids now. Um, working with my mentors that got me with this church, mm. uh, I was at their house party, like a Christmas party, I believe, and mm. everybody was just there. We were just all having a good time, and kids was there as well. And uh, I just went over and started playing with the kids. And uh, the wife of the mentor saw me, mm. and literally I turned around, she handed me the envelope, like, you need to sign this right now. <laughs> 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 she put you right in charge. She, she gave you a job right away. Uh, literally. Like, literally, oh, like, you need to sign this right now. Like, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> um, it told me that I'd be a good fit for the mm. kids' ministry. And uh, sure enough, I started it off, you know, mm. shouting at some other leaders there. And it ended up 
being the lead teacher. So I, I'd love you just to walk us through for a minute what it actually is like to get hit, like in the ring. So forget outside the ring for a minute, inside the ring. What's it like to take a hit, be on the ground? Like walk, walk me through that whole experience. So taking a hit in the cage is one a lifetime experience. You know, as yeah. soon as I've gotten hit, my mind just changed. Like, all right, well, I need to figure out a new game plan because I don't want to get hit like that again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's the mindset too of, of can I take it? You know, if I can't take a hit, I should not be in this ring. Mm. And by taking these hard hits, I realized that, okay, I can take it. Um, yes, it's painful. Even if I get down, knock it out on the ground, take it down, start working, say some jujitsu, or I'm in a bad position, you know, mm. I'm always trying to stay calm and relax and know that there's a way to get out to get back up mm. and keep fighting. Well, I was the one that was, they really wanted me to do the fighting for that. But um, I didn't want to hog all the glory by, by beating Ken Wolfmack to, to a pulp with, with one hand tied by my back. Yeah, that's real funny, isn't it? Nobody's laughing. You know, I do appreciate the fact that we have younger leaders at Kensington, younger men and women that are actually physically fit. Although Jeremiah raised some questions this week, didn't he? Um, I will say this, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I was Jeremiah's fifth choice to do the message here at Clarkson today, but uh, I feel loved and I knew you would be glad to see me, right? Yeah. yeah, awesome. I love the fact that we're one church a day. I love that we've got people on, uh, on the, watching on the live stream right now. Hey, you guys, love you and glad you, that you're out there. It's wonderful to be one church. And I think during COVID, it's been pretty cool for me that Kensington has been one church more than we've been in a long, long time since we went to multiple campuses and we've had some wonderful sharing. And I love, I do, I am excited about this series on Joseph and how to take a hit because 2020 has been the year of the hit. Wouldn't you say for a lot of us, it's been a very interesting year. For me personally, uh, 2020 was going to be the year of a lifetime. I had six global trips planned. I was taking teams of people all over the world. I had a, a couple of really cool hunting trips planned. I had this amazing year planned. And nothing happened, right? COVID happened, and a lot of this just went down to nothing. Although I did finally fly to Montana to see my son and got to fish, got to trout fish on the Yellowstone River for the first time which was amazing and a great experience. But I love Ken's story because I want you to think about this. Ken learned to fight because of the challenges he faced growing up and being a professional fighter, but also leading a kid's ministry to his church, going into public schools to encourage and challenge kids there. I love, you can see this on the screen. You can take a screenshot at this, but I believe this is, a lifetime theme for people that follow Jesus. I love how God took his early pain and turned it into his present platform. I just think this is what God does. God launched Kensington 30 years ago because as a kid, when I came to know Jesus Christ, I longed for my friends to be able to engage with Jesus Christ. And none of them were interested because all the churches we were connected to seemed to be so far removed from life. If I hadn't felt that pain, Kensington would have never started. Dave Wilson and Mark Nelson in different places in the world were experiencing the same feelings. It's amazing. God takes our pain and turns it into a platform. So for the next five weeks, we're going to look at the life of a man in the Bible named Joseph. And here's what I want you to just know about Joseph. When this story starts, Joseph is 17 years old. Now, 17 in Middle Eastern culture, in ancient culture, you were, you were a man by 17. And I'll tell you what, in this culture now, people that are 17 are still making man and woman choices, right? This is just to recognize that these choices are real. And so Joseph has no idea at 17 that his life is going to go sideways repeatedly. 
Nobody had any idea that 2020 was going to go as sideways as we thought it would. It's been a very, very humbling year. And here's what I want you to remember. This is your second screenshot if you want to learn it. Je Joseph overcame every effort, every circumstance that knocked him down. He actually became stronger. And in many ways, as we talked about, his pain became his platform. This is what God does. And I thought about this year. I thought about just globally. I thought about when they said that COVID was going to shut down Africa. A lot of you know that I love Africa. I love, love my brothers and sisters in Africa. And you're talking about millions upon millions of people have no safety net. Like it made no sense to me there at all. People that are uh, out in the middle of nowhere, people in the cities. And I thought, they, but they've weathered it. They've, they are still doing it. It slowed down some of our church planting. Right when COVID hit in one of the most heavily populated areas of Pocot, where we run for Hope Water for clean water, we plant churches there, they had major rain and landslides when hundreds of people were buried and killed in mudslides on the sides of mountains at the moment that COVID shut down, hit the world. California wildfires, election craziness, social unrest everywhere, confronting the issues of racism. And then on personal levels, people losing jobs. I, can't, I bet you I had 10 friends call me in March, lost their jobs. Some of them are working again. But marriage pressures, other people told me, said, man, we came home to a marriage and realized we got problems. Health issues, uh, kids being, I think I've felt worse for the kids. Haven't you, for a lot of you, that because it's so frustrating for them. But, but again, God's going to use this in their lives too. Emotions, all the things that we're hitting. And then lately, just this last week, as the weather was turning cold, I started to feel like, ugh, ugh. Anybody else feel that way? Like just missing this beautiful summer and fall that was just magical. And so in all of this, you get hit and you can end up crushed and beaten. Or you can be transformed. I just read how Scandinavian countries handle winter. And they say, so people that do well in the Nor Norway, Sweden, the northern countries, Finland, how do they do it? So it's all about attitude. <laughs> it's all about looking at the winner as an opportunity, not a penalty. The story of Joseph is exactly what this is. And it's interesting that I'm going to jump to the very end of the story. And I want to give you the theme verse for this whole five weeks. At the end of his journey with his brothers and all the crazy stuff that happened to Joseph, Joseph turns to his brothers when they are reunited and he, they think he's going to kill them because he's found himself in a place of power at the end of his story. And look at what he says to them. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now, I want, to give you, I want to give you a tip, give you a fun tip, okay, everybody? It's, it's not necessarily a Christian book, but it's based on a Bible story, David and Goliath. It's Malcolm Gladwell's book, David and Goliath, where he taught, the whole book is about how you take disadvantages, people face the disadvantages of their life, and turn them into advantages. It's absolutely thrilling. It's an incredible book. He talks about... Um, um, uh, Frau Reich, Dr. Frau Reich, who, who was the guy that figured out and cured childhood leukemia. And he literally fought people for decades. He didn't care. Everybody was against him. He has literally saved countless lives from childhood leukemia. Uh, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. I was born in 1956. And in this Christmas day of 1956, on the day that I was seven months old, which by the way, my granddaughter is seven months old today, Janie Lynn. When I was seven months old, Fred Shuttlesworth had announced that he was going on Monday morning, 
was going to get on the segregated all-white bus and ride it. And on the Christmas Day before that Monday, his house was bombed, was blown up with 16 sticks of dynamite. And do you know what he did? The people had crowded around. The policemen showed up. Uh, a couple of his kids were, were uh, uh, they were in the back of the house. But he, he yells out. He goes, I'm not coming out of this house naked. Somebody bring me something to put on. Literally, the clothes had been blown off of him. But he, it didn't stop him. The next Monday, he was on that bus riding it. It's incredible. That is the story, right, of the window of my life, 1956. And then he told his church, he said, uh, the next Sunday, before, be, the day before he was going to ride the bus, he said, I just want you to know something. He said, Monday morning, I'm walking to the bus stop from this church building. And he says, and I'm not going to turn and look around to see if anybody's following me. Doesn't matter. Doesn't, whether anybody follows me or not, doesn't matter. I'm going to go and I'm going to get on that bus. You see the point is that when you face the hits of life, they're either going to crush you or you're going to be transformed and you're going to be stronger as a result. One last story about Fred Shuttlesworth. Two weeks after riding that bus and getting beaten up, he took his two daughters to enroll in an all-white school in Birmingham. This is 1956. He was nearly beaten to death he was taken to the hospital. A few days later, his children were brought into the hospital room to see him. And he turned to his kids. He says, I want you to remember something about this. He said, you always forgive. You always forgive. You see, the circumstances of your life will crush you or they'll transform you. That's what we're going to see in this series. And David, I mean, Joseph says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it to accomplish what is being done, the saving of many lives. So, here's what we're going to look at today. How do we grow our resiliency? How do we grow our grit to withstand the difficult moments of life? Because we have learned, studies have shown, that the people, that there, there's, this, there's this magical something in people that allows certain people to overcome the greatest difficulties. There's like this internal internal toughness that's out there. How do we develop this? How do we become a, a, a Fred Shuttlesworth or, or a Berta Radford? My, my grandmother was 29 when, when my grandfather was killed in a plane crash, and, and the next month was the stock market crash of 1929. Lost everything. And she raised three daughters who were five, three, and one. How do you do that? Lived to be 100 years old. Was here when we dedicated the Troy building in 1999. How do you develop this? This is what Joseph is going to teach us. So, let's look at the story. Genesis 37. Uh, I'm going to begin in verse 1 and 2, just so you hear it, and then we'll, then we'll get into the scriptures on the screen. It says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. And this is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers. And by the way, his brothers were the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, who were his father's wives' servants. So Jacob ended up having 12 sons from four different women. So, you could, so just to start this off, this is going to be a really unified family. <laughs> this is going to be a problem. And by the way, if you go to the Bible to study how good families function, good luck. Because they're all messed up. The Bible is the worst book on families. And then Jacob, then Joseph, who is watching the flocks, brings his father a bad report about his brothers. So what is the first thing we learn about Joseph? He's a snitch. He's a, he's a snitch. He guys, he's a jerk to his brothers. I, I want to tell you something. I've got four kids, and all of my kids rebelled. I don't know why, because I was the perfect father. <laughs> but all of my kids had periods of strong rebellion. You know what's interesting? They're all adults now, 35, 33, 31, and 27. And not one of them ever snitched on any of the others. That's a really interesting thing. They, they knew 
they were met, they, 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 but they didn't snitch. So anyway, this is not a positive, I don't think. People say, well, well he wanted his No, he's just snitching on his brothers. And so he begins the perfect storm. Now, not only is he a snitch, but guess what? He's the precious. Look at verse 3. It says, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. He was born to the woman that he really loved. So he had children from four women, but there was only one woman that he really loved, and that he was the firstborn son of that woman who had struggled with infertility. And so he made an ornate robe for him, which, by the way, his brothers are going to really appreciate. They're going to be so happy about that. When his brothers saw that they're, I'm being funny right now, you guys. You can, if you have permission to laugh. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them. They hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So this is a very nice way of saying this family was in complete upheaval. Somebody would say, you know, uh, my parents have a favorite. And uh, I, I know one guy told me, he said, my dad, I, I was my dad's favorite. and He didn't even try to hide it. And then someone said, I remember this, someone said, uh, if you grew up in a bigger family, you might know this feeling. Somebody goes, I grew up in a big family, and my parents didn't have a favorite. And somebody else would go, go no, that just meant it wasn't you. <laughs> so I was the youngest of five kids, and I was the favorite, at least in my mind. And so there's all this unhealthy dynamic, and it, a lot of it is centered around this coat. The one, one Old Testament commentator says this. This is going to be interesting. Most of you won't know this. The tunic was sleeved. So the tunic that, that Jacob gave Joseph because he loved him was, was all the way to the sleeves and all the way to the ankles. And the conclusion from this Hebrew word, pasim, which means wrists or ankles, you can't work in that kind. You can't go out and, sh and, go, and, and shepherd the flock. Wearing something down, down, to, down to the ground. We know that in everything that we studied about shepherds or whatever, most of them would have had a, a cutoff because they'd have been out in rough area and they would have had short garments probably no, no further than to the top of their knees because they're out there working hard. So pretty boy, he's got his little fancy coat on. He's not working. What's he doing? He's snitching. He's telling on his brother's. It would be like sending a welder to a construction site wearing a full-length mink coat. So instead of toning things down, it gets worse. In Genesis 35, at verse 5, it's 37 verse 5, it says Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Now think about this. Does anybody like Joseph very much right now? No, I don't. He, he goes to his brothers and he says, listen to to this dream I had. This is great. Guys, listen to this. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. <laughs> Isn't that a cool dream? And his brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. And then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers, listen, I had another dream. And this time the sun, moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. You see, Joseph didn't have, at this point, at age 17, a lot of emotional intelligence. In fact, it's funny. I, I went back trying to think back in my own family. I had two, two older brothers and two sisters, and my second brother was a world-class athlete. He was first-team high school All-American in football and baseball. Coach's Magazine, back in those days, he was an amazing athlete. But I remember in our family, we were always real competitive, and everybody was argue, always arguing who was the greatest except him. He was always quiet because <laughs> he knew he was the best. And, but we didn't resent it. We, we kind of enjoyed his success. 
He, it was just one of my greatest thrills was watching him compete in high school. But Joseph is in a divided family. Remember, all of his brothers except Benjamin are half-brothers. And some of them were, from the, were, were sons of the maidservants who were definitely second class in their minds. And Joseph is telling this story and he is creating a horrible family problem. Even his dad gets angry at him and says, what are you doing? So, so basically, at the beginning of the story, Joseph is a punk, dad spoils him, and the rest of the brothers hate him. This is going to be a really great story. So his, bro- his dad, in the midst of this, sends his, his, his son Joseph to see how the flocks are doing in a different part of the country. So his brothers, verse 12, had gone to graze the father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Which is not very smart. Because he's already told on them very well. So he said, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring back word to me. What's his dad doing? His dad's a jerk. His dad's turning his son, the special boy, and he's just going to go and report back. And, and how do you think his brothers are going to respond? So he said, go and see if all is well. So he went off. And verse 18, they saw him in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. This is, here comes that dreamer, said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him, and we'll see what comes of his dreams. And again, we don't have time to teach this today, but it says when Reuben heard this, he tried. What did he do? He tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. And Reuben said this, to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. It's interesting. You know why Reuben said that? Because Reuben was the only one of the brothers so far that if you look back before chapter 37, had a litany of failures. He had already failed his father. He had already been immoral. He had already blown it. And so he did not want to destroy his family, even though he was probably the worst. He, he was he had already disappointed his father but he wanted to save his half brother and so when joseph came to his brothers they stripped him of his robe the ornate robe he was wearing and they took him and threw him into the cistern and the cistern was empty it'd be like just a big empty well there was no water in it but something that he couldn't climb out and as they sat down to eat their meal they looked up and saw a caravan of ishmaelites coming from gilead and the camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, just like for Jesus. And they were on their way to take them to Egypt. And Joseph, Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Guess what? Judah had also messed up. The two guys that actually try to, try to do something end up just making it worse. Judah said, what will we gain if we kill him and cover his blood? Come. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. Wow. I bet you I would be a millionaire if I had $100 for every time someone has come to me over the last 40 years and said, yeah, my brother and I don't talk to each other anymore. My sister and I don't. Yeah, we don't talk to each other. I haven't talked to my, my sister in 30 years. Or say, yeah, that's my business. So we used to work together. No, we don't talk to each other anymore. The brokenness of relationships that we see in the world, almost probably every person sitting in this room and watching on live stream thinks of people they used to be in relationship with that they're not anymore because life breaks us up and it hurts us and it either crushes us or transforms us. And at this moment, this 17-year-old boy who's been the golden child is going to step into a 20-year window 
where it's not going to be anything but blow after blow after blow. And he's going to have to learn how to take a hit. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to look at several aspects of Joseph's life. How he not only survived, but survived through these hits. But the first one, as Craig McGlasson was leading us in this, is so easily overlooked, is that you never gain strength until you start taking blows. One of the huge mistakes sometimes we make as parents is we work too hard to protect our kids from the blows of life, right? But how did you get strong? How did you learn to care for other people? How did you learn to overcome adversity? By facing it. And so this moment is where all the wheels are going to come off. This is where the journey begins for Joseph. His brother's betraying him. His dad putting a target on him. And then ultimately, he says, cool, God's going to give him a vision of his future. But a couple of things I want you to think about today. I want you to take them home today to really think about this story. Even though all these factors play into where Joseph ended up, it's just important to acknowledge right now at the beginning of this story that the one common thread, the greatest explanation for the hits that Joseph took was what? His own self-absorbed pride. It's his own pride. The hits he took were because he was proud. He's telling his brothers, hey, you're going to bow down to me. Like, what? Dude, what are you, smoking something? What are you thinking? This is not going to end well. And I thought maybe you've seen it in yourself. I was reflecting on this. And I want you to think about this. When life hits us, our first response is almost immediately to look for who to blame. And sometimes the fist hitting us in the face is what? It's our own. Vast majority of the time, when life turns south, we want to blame other people. But you know who's the first to blame? Ourselves. I would say for 17 years, first 17 years of my marriage, I blamed Paula for what was wrong about our marriage. I blamed her for being overweight, me, me being overweight. I said, if you would just grocery shop differently and cook differently, I wouldn't be overweight. <laughs> like, the only way I could say that is if she were actually taking the fork and feeding me. But this craziness of blaming, I blamed my low income for my bad money management for years. It's funny, when I finally took Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University 11 years ago, changed my life, because the first thing Dave Ramsey is, is stop being a victim. You're not a victim. He says, I don't care how much money you make. Stop being a victim. I blame my kids for being rebellious. I had a really hard time and still do, looking in the mirror and seeing where the real problem starts. Anybody, so just curious, anybody else? Anybody elbowing their spouse right now? Oh. It's easy to do. Taking personal responsibility for our mistakes and their consequences is never fun. But this is where it's got to begin for Joseph. So I'm going to give you three things to think about. I'm going to give you three little steps to think about. First one is this. Three keys to surviving and, and thriving and being transformed in the hits of life. This is number one. I want to challenge you today to think about stepping up to the scale. It's like a morning weigh-in, like Ken Wolfback, before he goes into a, to one, of his, one of his fights. It's not fun to see the reality of yourself when it's not what you want to be true about yourself. That's why a lack of responsibility often leads us to conclude, to, to say to another person, you're the problem and I'm the victim. You're a jerk and I'm misunderstood. Everyone is against me and I'm doing my best. But here's the challenge of stepping up the scale. No one steps on the scale and thinks, I really hope it says that I'm 12 pounds lighter than I really am. Please, 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 please. 
because usually the scale doesn't lie. Although, this is funny, we just got a new scale, and yesterday I weighed, uh, at one point I weighed 185, and I got on it again, I weighed 355 pounds. <laughs> so sometimes the scale does lie, and I'm somewhere in between those two. But if you have a good scale, it's going to tell you the truth about your life. And I'll be honest with you, when COVID started in March, I weighed 220 I weighed 231 pounds this morning. I hate that scale. <laughs> Step up to the scale. And here's the challenge. Again, you might want to take a picture of this. You cannot fix what you will not face. You can't fix what you will not face. You've got to look at this. Look at Psalm 139. I love this. This is, this is the writer of Psalms. Step it up on the scale. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there's any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. First thing I want to say today in terms of these, this stepping up the scale, I want to just lovingly encourage you and myself, and I already did it with the with the band and the, the tech support. Everybody was here early this morning when we prayed. I said, listen, is there something in your life that you're continuing to justify that is hurting your life? Is there a toxic relationship you're in that you're continuing to make excuses about? Is there a, a slightly illegal business practice you find yourself flirting with that you know is wrong? Are you being ungracious to your children or to your spouse in a way that you need to go today? I need to look at that in the mirror and ask God to begin changing that function. Because see, if Joseph could have looked in the mirror, he'd go, when is it ever going to help you showing up to somebody else and going, hey, guess what? I just had this dream. And in the dream, I'm awesome and you're not. Isn't that cool? In this dream, I'm going to be rich and people are going to love me. Guess what? You're a total loser. And guess what? I think I have more dreams coming like that. Wow. This is what we do to each other. That's why I know that all the years we thought about it, so wouldn't it be cool if we could start a church where nobody's a celebrity? And for the most part, we've been able to avoid that. One of the things I love about Jeremiah's leadership is what does Jeremiah do? He makes everybody feel amazing, right? He makes other people feel like they're the most important person in the world. He's a good, what a gift. That's the anti-Joseph gift. So that's what, but I thought, God, search me. And if there's something about my life, let me know. And by the way, when I do that, Sometimes it's a whole list. <laughs> but it's important to look at those things. So step up to the scale. Did anybody actually take a screenshot of that to remember that? Did anybody? Okay, good. There's three of you. The rest of you. <laughs> uh, no, this is so good. Step up to the scale. The second one is this. And this goes right back to Ken Wolfmack and the fighting. Listen to the voices in your corner. Listen to the voices in your corner. So if life is a boxing match, you've got to have people in your corner that are cheering you on. In fact, oh, shoot, I left it over there. Brian Tome, good friend of mine who's, Brian's kind of become a celebrity. He's the pastor of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, huge church, and he's been, he's had a reality TV show. It's, he's a really interesting guy, but he said today, he said, listen, the biggest mistake men make that women don't is they, as they get older, they don't have other men in their corner telling the truth. Oh, this is really important. And uh, as Craig McGlasson was writing this, he says, nobody lies to us like we lie to ourselves, which is why it's so important to know whose voice you'll trust before the moment comes when you don't know who to trust. Joseph's dad tried to be one of those persons in his life. In the beginning of the story, Joseph wouldn't listen. Joseph got to the point where he didn't listen even to his dad who had honored him and loved him. The third thing that I want you to see, though, and, and 
in this whole idea of listening to the voice in your cor corner is you have to learn how to ignore the critics. But how do you tell the difference between critics and friends? And this is, I think this is on the screen, isn't it? A friend hurts you to help you. A critic hurts you to hurt you. And by the way, for those of us that are older, the, the way social media, you guys are, that, that, social, that uh, Netflix documentary on that was really fascinating, but for our, the generation below us, for children, for teenagers, there is this just poisonous criticism. So at 64, if a poisonous criticism comes to me, I, I have a lot of my self-identity kind of, it's not going to destroy me, so I'm not going to, but man, people that are growing up in that, and this, this meanness, by, by the way, I love it, a, a guy, I got a friend, he goes, he goes, could, could we just for one day drop the, just the poisonous, mean comments and the, the hurtful things that we're saying to each other? And then he put it at the bottom and he says, and oh, by the way, we really need Michigan State to beat Michigan today. <laughs> that was funny. Okay, he's like, can we just stop the poisonous comments and the mean-spirited? Anyway, I laughed. I thought it was funny. Uh, unless you're a Michigan fan. Uh, but I thought, you've got to have people in your life who love you enough to tell you the truth. And look at this scripture. The scripture is incredible. In Proverbs. The Proverbs has a lot of verses about this. But it says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Wow. What a moment. Let me take a minute. I want to tell you a story, but before I do that, I want to do just to mark our offering moment. Uh, there are, you know, because of COVID, we don't, we don't pass this, but I want to thank all of you that are on watching on the stream right now live and people that are here thank you for your faithful partnership there's still really neat stuff that kensington is doing around the world and we're continuing to be able to do that because of your your faithfulness with us we're able to continue it's been a an amazing year of serving and of investing in people and uh i just want to let you know there are these it's easy to give you can give on the text some of you can uh, uh that are maybe more technologically challenged, you can still do it. But I want to thank you for your partnership. Some of you that maybe you're not connected with us right now, would, would love for you to, to join us in this mission. It would be really great. And I would say this, in terms of just being truthful, whether it's Kensington or something else, a life of generosity, of intentional generosity, you cannot have a good life, ultimately, without intentional generosity. You just can't. I don't mean like a one moment or I'm not, I'm not talking about a GoFundMe page, which is cool. I think that's great. I'm talking about I am going to be an intentionally generous person and I'm going to think it's through strategically in the same way I plan my budget, live my life. That's just word, a word to the wise. Because better is open rebuke than hidden love. And by the way, so here's the story. About two months into Kensington, I was really struggling. This was 30 years ago. And I had given a really, really bad message that Sunday. And again, it might be today too. So maybe I'll have to hear this again from somebody else today. But this was 30 years ago. And Pete Vanderharst was on our original team. Pete actually started Portable Church Industries out of Kensington, which has helped start 3,000 churches in the U.S. with their technical needs. Amazing guy. And he walked up to me. Does anybody know this story? Anybody knows me? He walks up to me. This is about three months in, and we had about 300 people coming. And he goes, Steve, I just want you to know something, man. You are solving all of our problems. He goes, I, I just want to tell you, you keep preaching like this. He says, we're not going to have any money problems. We're not going to have any parking problems. We're not going to have any space problems in the auditorium. We're not going to have any problems because we're not going to exist. <laughs> Just thought you'd like to know that. <laughs> and he turns and walks away. <laughs> Come on, that's funny. <laughs> I'm just standing there like, but you know what? 
better is open rebuke than hidden love. He told me the truth. I got better. I worked a lot harder at it after those days. So listen to the voices in your corner. Step up on the scale. And the third one now, what I just want to prepare you for as we go through this series is this. Believe that God has good plans for you. I really think this is important today. Uh, some of you are struggling or you, you got people in your life. So much of the scripture is say, believe that God is going to work things out. That God has good plans for you. Okay, good. Thank you. In Romans 8, 28. Did we get that one, Josh? Did we do that or just 8.31? You got 8.28? So 8.28 where it says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Like one of the things you can count on. So is everything happening to you good? No. He's saying all the stuff that happens, even the terrible stuff, God can still take the pain the destruction, and still be working at stuff in your life. Paula and I had five years of absolute valley of shadow of death in our marriage. We didn't think we were going to come through it. But you know what God did? Man, has God used that for good in other people's life? Would I want to go back and do that five years again? You, could, you couldn't pay me a, you could, well, maybe if you gave me 10 million. Maybe for 10 million. No, I don't think I would do it for 20 million. 30 million, maybe. <laughs> it was terrible. But God used it. God has good plans for you. And look at this. This is bon bonus verse. I love this. The Apostle Paul, who, by the way, this is, we're jumping from Joseph now to the New Testament where Paul is promising what life is for people that know Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ has promised. And you got to remember, Paul, as a Jewish leader, was, was basically in a holy war, a jihad against Christians until he met Jesus personally. So he was out there hurting people. Look at what he says after he met Christ. He says, what shall we then say in response to these things? And I thought, what things? Everything. I mean, think of everything possible that could be out there. There's not one person on this stage that isn't going through something weird right now. And I'm too, and you are too. What shall we say if God is for us? Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? This is really the story of Joseph. Because Joseph's going to lose everything, but God's going to restore his life. That's what God does. That's what Jesus does along the way. And here's, as we, as we enjoy this month of November in this series on Joseph, I want to say this. What is it that God wants to restore in you? What is it? Because I bet you there's tough stuff happening. There's worries, anxiety. Listen, I could give you a list a page long of all the things that I'm worried about. But is Jesus Christ faithful? Has he promised to be faithful to whatever it is that you're living in? I would say to you, believe that he has good plans for you. And believe me, there were moments where Joseph did not believe that. <laughs> and neither will we. But it doesn't change the fact that his faithfulness is real. And that we are not victims. We're conquerors in Christ. If God is for us, who can be against us? That is an amazing principle. So Lord, thank you for this time that we've had today. Thank you for this final song that we get to share today that just reminds us of the truth that we've talked about today. And Lord, for my brothers and sisters here at the Clarkson campus and those that are watching online and how much we'd love to all be together, but Lord, Lord, that hasn't been possible for this year. We are trusting you and believing you've got good things planned for our lives. And we believe, Lord, that the things that are happening to us are not going to crush us. But by the power of your Holy Spirit, they're going to transform us. They're going to continue to grow us. And not only to transform us, but to give us a message of hope and encouragement to give to other people. We're so grateful for all you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm no victim, I 
live with the vision I'm covered by the force of love I'm covered in my Savior's blood I am no orphan I'm not a poor man The kingdom's now become my own And with the King I found a home He's not just reviving Not simply restoring Greater things have yet to come And greater things have yet to come He is my Father I do not wonder if his plans for me are good and if he'll come through like he should, he is provision and enough wisdom to usher in my brightest days to turn my morning to praise He's not just reviving not simply restoring greater things have yet to come and greater things have yet to come I was caught up in the moment. Thank was, you. That was kind of in the moment, wow. weren't you? That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Great Grace. Job. Thank you, worship team. Gosh. That song was perfect for today's message, wasn't it? So good. God, that's who, that's who, who we are in Christ. That's God's promise. Yeah. So good. So good. Just I want to thank you so much um, for being here. I really hope that you all come back, whether you're in person or watching us online next week, so we can continue on um, with this series because yeah. I think it's going to be, I think it's really going to have a huge impact. I really do. Yeah. Thank you for your challenge. I've already been praying about it and sitting in that. So I'm, I'm excited even for myself, this personal Great. journey. Appreciate it. Y'all give Steve Andrews another round of applause. Thank you so much. Woo. Great crowd today. Love you. All right, Clarkson Campus. We'll see you next week. Have Thanks. a good week.